Welcome to the France 24 interview. My guest today is one of the world's leading researchers on artificial intelligence. She's an academic at McGill University in Montreal, but also the leader of Facebook's artificial intelligence lab uh, in the city. Dr. Joël Pinot, thank you very much for speaking to us. Hello. Artificial intelligence is such a wide field. Can you just give us, first of all, an idea of what your research specializes in? Mm. I specialize in a branch of AI called reinforcement learning. And this is the branch that's uh, focused on figuring out how can machines make good decisions, in particular when they need to make many decisions. So how do they learn to make these decisions? And we develop the mathematical models, the computer algorithms that underlie that technology. And then that technology can be applied to solve problem, decision-making problems in several different fields. So how did you get involved with Facebook? Um, I had known the Facebook researchers for many years. The lab started four years ago. Um, and uh, we meet in conferences, and I've been following their research, particularly the research of their dialogue group. Um, and we were doing work in parallel in the university. And so at some point, they, I think, uh, started looking a little bit more closely in Montreal. We opened a few conversations, and it was a natural partner for me to join because we'd been following their research so closely. And how does the work that you do with Facebook differ from your academic work in terms of the areas of research or the things that you focus on? Um, in many ways, this fundamental research on reinforcement learning is something that I do with both hats on. Um, what differs a little bit more is the type of applications we look at. So at the university, I have several projects and collaborations with researchers in the Faculty of Medicine where we apply this technology to solve specific problems in terms of developing better treatment strategies for chronic disease. On the Facebook side, we have conversations with several of the product team and try to evaluate whether there's an interesting technology transfer opportunity for those, for those different products and platforms. So where might your work be applied to in Facebook? To Facebook users, I suppose, what would they identify that? Yeah, we're, we're st I have to say we're still really exploring that space. Um, when I started at Facebook, and the role of myself and my team is really to do the fundamental research. Um, that being said, we are very open to conversations with people, with teams across the company, and we're now really at the phase of having these conversations. I explain the technology, they explain the problems they have, and we're trying to see what are the opportunities. Um, but there's, there's many cases where you may need to decide um, what information to present on the platform, how to present that information. These are all the type of decision-making problems where our technology might be useful. Facebook has been in the news a lot this year because of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Did that give you any pause for thought with your involvement in the company? It uh, certainly caused a lot of uh, reflection in terms of what is the... What, it, what are the real problems there, right? There, there's what you hear about in the media, but then we tried to distill that in some fundamental technical problems. And so I think there's been a lot of conversations about what do we need to solve at the technology level to be able to enable the company to better protect the data, to better um, provide services to the, the user base. Artificial intelligence provides so many opportunities for technology to develop in new ways. There's also a lot of ethical questions that it poses for people. You know, a lot of people are scared of the idea of, of machine learning taking over elements of, of what is currently human interaction. How do you kind of consider that when you look at what you're researching? Mm -hmm. I find um, it, in many ways the fears and the ethical concerns are not necessarily the same, right? People are afraid of some things that for me, are not really the, the, the problems which we need to deal with today in terms of ethical concerns. And, and so I'm really focused on trying to identify what are those places where in the short term we need to find solutions. If we look at something like um, bias in decision making, right? The systems we have are trained from data. That data may or not be representative of society or the behavior that we want our system to exhibit. And so trying to develop better systems to incorporate more balanced view of data that produces better decisions and that has some ethical components and it has some technical components. I was interested in some of your work in the medical field mm -hmm. and how AI can influence or rather assist in things like medical decision making. How does that work? Um, there's several different projects and so many more in terms of potential. It's an incredible time, I think, to um, be looking at these problems. Uh, one of the problems we've been uh, active in for a few years is looking at the use, again, of reinforcement learning to improve strategies for neurostimulation for patients with epilepsy. 
So think of a small device, a little bit like a pacemaker, but for the brain, that delivers electrical stimulation and tries to abort seizures in patients with epilepsy. And so it's a case where um, we can write out a strategy of how to do the stimulation, but quite frankly, the machine can learn to do it better because it can read the signal in the brain in real time using electrodes and adapt the strategy in real time to what's going on in the brain. The more you learn about this field, does it make to start, do you start asking yourself questions about the elements of what is humanity? Because there are certain elements that, as you say, we see machine learning replacing or doing better. So do you kind of start identifying things then that you see as very clearly human attributes in, in the way that we work? Yeah, as the technology gets better, in many ways, we, we get closer to the performance of humans on certain tasks, right? Right now, AI is still developed in a very narrow way. So we are able to solve a specific problem of how to do neurostimulation, how to play chess, how to uh, understand language. Um, I, I think in many ways what really makes the strength of humanity is still how fluidly we can go from one task to the other with essentially the same system. Montreal has become a centre for artificial intelligence research now. Uh, it's something that you know, the French government wants to develop as well. What would you say that it is that perhaps maybe France could learn from Montreal in this? Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not here to teach lessons. I'm really here to find out what's going on in France. Um, I, I can tell you a little bit what I think are some of the ingredients in Montreal that has made a difference. Um, one of them is uh, the fact that we have strong public universities um, that attract very good students. One of them is the fact that for many years we've had sustained financial uh, support for fundamental research. So the, the research topics that are fashionable today, deep learning, reinforcement learning, AI, were not always fashionable. And even in those times where some sort of short-term horizon indicate this is not where to put the money, the financial support for fundamental research was there in Canada and allowed our labs to continue those lines of research to build the expertise. And when those lines of research became fashionable and we saw the product impact, um, we were ready to, to build on that. Is it important for the development of this sector that companies like Facebook are involved and are putting money into that research? We're certainly seeing the research move much faster because of the large involvement of companies. In particular, you know, they're giving um, resources. This research takes a lot of resource, in particular in terms of computation power. They're giving these access to these resources, which is really enabling um, many, many advancements. When you look at the field of, of AI, do you see huge developments coming very soon? Or what, what sort of timeline are you working on in projects that, that you're working on? Yeah, the, the forward prediction is, is very, very hard. But if I look just a little bit further back, right, in, in terms of what progress have we made last year, or the last two years, the last five years, it's been huge. There's been a lot of problems that we didn't know how to solve before that we know now how to solve. Um, in particular, in terms of computer vision, we understand how to analyze images much better. Um, now we're seeing progress moving into areas of understanding language. And we're seeing the progress in specific tasks, speech recognition, automatic machine translation, where the computer will translate from English to French. Um, we're seeing progress there. And now we are going to hopefully be able to do better in terms of the harder tasks, such as how to have conversations. Technology in many sectors has a diversity problem. It's largely male dominated in things like coding. Is this something that you are hopeful to see changes with the students that you're working with, for example, coming down the line? I think it, it, it continues to be a challenge. We don't have all the solutions. Um, there's a lot of gender imbalance, but there's also um, not that much diversity in terms of um, many other aspects, in terms of, for example, having people from different um, ethnic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, and so on. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's something that many people are paying attention to at this point, so I'm hopeful that will change things. Uh, I think it's important for the quality of the technology we develop. If I look at our you know, graduate labs right now, which are the people who are coming into our industry, we still have a lot of work to do. If I look at the undergrad level, we're doing a lot better. So there's some hope that some of these people will, will choose careers in research as well as in technology development. And what can be done to encourage, for example, more women to get involved in the field? There's a lot of different hypotheses. Um, one thing that we've seen really be effective at McGill University in terms of our undergrad program is to really keep the door open for a very long time. 
many of our uh, male students know from entering their university degree that they want to major in computer science. For many of the women, they make that choice much later on in their degree. They take a course, a second course, a third course, decide that they actually really love the topic, and then decide to major in it. But it, uh, it takes a longer time to see the, see, for the interest to develop. As well as your scientific work, you're also a talented violinist. Um, do you feel there is this overlap between music and science? Um, I, I, it's hard for me to put in words what the overlap is. I, I think I have... Um, is it creativity? I, I think for me, the fact that I have this opening on this whole other world is really a way to nourish my creativity in science. The fact that I look at the world and that I know people from all sorts of different uh, professions, environment, from creative fields uh, really gives me a much, I think, wider outlook on life and how to solve problems. Should it be an element that we include more in science education, the idea of more arts creativity? I'm one to really th think we, as long as possible, we should maintain a diversity of uh, fields in the education system. Children should continue, even those who are not strong in math, should continue to study math in students who uh, have a scientific profile should continue to also practice the arts and to develop their other, their other knowledge. Okay, Dr. Joël Pino from Facebook's AI Research Lab in Montreal and of McGill University as well. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you for you uh, to you for watching as well. The news continues on France 24. Do stay with us.